Hello, everyone. I'm Nick Vidal. I work with the OSI, which is the Open Source Initiative. Uh, we have uh, a long history together with Debian. Actually, uh, one of the uh, main uh, core leaders of the Debian 20 years ago, who is Bruce Perrins, he helped define what's open source. He wrote the open source definition. So we really have a, a good history together. Uh, I have my slides both in Portuguese and English. I just want to ask, uh, to get a sense of what's the audience here, if you guys speak English or Portuguese. Can anybody, uh, if you guys speak only Portuguese, can you raise your hand, please? So everybody speaks English. Okay, so I'll, I'll be giving this talk in English. There's a part that's in, in Portuguese, but we can work that out as well. So um, I like the logo here. It's quite similar if you see it. So uh, we have this shared, shared history and also shared values. Uh, the Debian project has always been a, promoment, a proponent of free software and of open source. And I'll, I'll go a bit through our, our history together. So, um, actually, open source was preceded by the free software movements. We have a lot, a lot in common. And uh, the free software uh, definition uh, was created by Richard Salman. And basically, there are four freedoms that uh, that, that we share. So the freedom number, number zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish for any purpose. The freedom number one is the freedom to study how the program works and change it so it does your computing as you wish. The freedom number two is the freedom to read distribute copies so you can help your neighbor. And the freedom number three is the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions to others. So basically, those are the four freedoms. And this has been developed uh, and has been working for over 35 years. Actually, the whole uh, the history behind sharing code and working together, collaborating with others, it's much longer than that. It has existed since uh, computing has started, and only later did proprietary sof software came into scene. So Richard Stallman, when he saw this, he wanted to go back to roots where everybody could share code and uh, have those freedoms uh, to enjoy uh, sharing and collaborating and working together. If you look at the, uh, so here is in, uh, the definition in Portuguese, if anybody in the audience would like to, to see this. I'll make the, the slides available uh, on the website as well, so both those who speak Portuguese and English, they can understand. And this is the open source definition. What's interesting here is that uh, both the open source definition and the free software definition, they're very much compatible. They, they were actually, the open source definition was inspired by the free software movements. They all came together. Sometimes uh, people see those fights between the open source advocates and the free software advocates, but actually we share much more in common than we have differences. So this is something that we should celebrate. Instead of fighting each other, we should work together. And in fact, uh, the open so source definition was uh, drafted by Bruce Perrins of course, with community inputs uh, over 20 years ago. And this was uh, inspired by the Debian free software guidelines. So Debian, the Debian project was core to the open source definition. It was your guidelines that inspired the creation of the open source definition. I wonder if uh, people knew about this. Uh, did, does anybody? Uh, know about this? Did you guys know about this? Yeah, so, so you guys are core to the open source definition. And it was very much inspired by, by the free software movement. So the, the Debian free software guidelines, uh, they're part of the Debian social contracts, 
and there are actually uh, 10, uh, I, I don't think you'll be able to see the 10th one here, but there are actually 10 uh, main uh, principles. So the first one is the free redistribution of the code. The second one is to have the source code available. The third one is to allow de derived works. You can change the code and, and redistribute it. The fourth one is the integrity of the author's source code. The fifth one is the no discrimination against persons or groups. The, uh, the sixth uh, principle is no discrimination against uh, areas of uh, endeavor. The seventh, oops, <coughs> fields of endeavor. The seventh principle is the distribution of the lessons. The eighth principle is the lessons must be not must not be specific to a product. The ninth one is the lessons must not restrict other software. And the tef, tenth one, which you guys can't see here, is the it must be technology neutral. So uh, I wanted to explore each one of these uh, in more detail and to have a, a conversation with you guys. Um, since I was actually expecting people in the audience to be more Portuguese focused, so I, I actually had my slides here. Uh, in Portuguese for each one of these. So uh, I'll just take a moment and I'll, I'll load the English version, if you guys don't mind. Uh, do you guys prefer that? I, I believe so, right? So just a second, please. I, I might need your help, <laughs> if you can. Perfect. Okay, so we have the, the English version here. My apologies for that. Let me zoom, in, zoom this in. Ah, pode ser. Agradeço. É só, só para passar para baixo. Tá, obrigado. Uhum. Pode ser a primeira, o primeiro principle. Okay, so about the free redistribution. And if you guys want to comment that, if you guys have any questions regarding that, just let me know. So uh, one of the main, uh, the main uh, principles is being allowed to redistribute your codes. I think that's really important. And so uh, let me read that. Uh, the, the lessons sh shall not restrict any party from selling or giving away the software as a component of an aggregate software distribution containing programs from several different sources. The lessons shall not restrict a royalty or other fee for such sale. So since the very beginning, you're allowed to make money from free software. That's one of the reasons uh, why uh, we created the term open source, because the free in English, uh, tends to be associated with gr gratis, as in free, and perhaps not freedom. So uh, companies didn't did not understand. Some companies did not understand that in fact you can sell uh, free software, and in fact this this is encouraged. So by not when you launch a, a software, 
you can't uh, an open source software, you can't say you can't make money of this or you can't create a service or put it in the clouds and create a service around this. So this is one of the, the important aspects, one of the important principles around uh, open source software. Uh, and of course, the second one is about uh, making the source code available. It wouldn't be possible for you to study the source code and to modify the source code if you don't have that. So uh, the program must include source code and must allow distribution in source code as well as compile form. Um, so th this is uh, very basic. Uh, there are a lot of software that uh, the source is available, but they are not open source because they don't allow you to modify, they don't allow you to uh, sell the service. Uh, so even though this is one of the principles to have the source available, you have to have much more freedom to be a free software and to be open source. Uh, the third one, is derived works. So uh, again, this is very much about the, uh, the ability to modify the work, one of the four freedoms. So the lessons must allow modifications and derived works and must allow them to be distributed under the same terms as the lessons of the original software. Um, this is very much w one of the uh, aligns with the free, free software definition. Uh, the fourth one is the integrity of the author's source code. So uh, let's suppose that Debian launches uh, version 10. You, you guys just launched version 10 of Debian, right? You can't have some, some other party launch Debian version 10 uh, and be a software that's totally different from, from, from that one because that, that goes against the author's source code. So uh, that creates confusion. People won't know what's Debian 10, what's the, what's the 10th version. So you have to respect that. And if you want to create a, a derivative from this, if you want to take the Debian 10 version and create a, a new software around that, even the same, uh, the same version, you have to uh, use another name and uh, another version number so it won't confuse uh, users. Uh, so that's what the, what the fourth principle is about. Uh, the fifth one is about the no discrimination against persons or groups. So you can't restrict the software and say only Americans can use this code or only Brazilians can use this code or any type of group of people. Only uh, the boys, the boys club can use this type of code. So everybody can use the software. If it's truly free and open source software, anybody in the whole world can use this. Of course, uh, as you guys probably are aware, uh, the United States has some restrictions in terms of uh, who can uh, sell or uh, create a service to some types of countries. Uh, but that's another thing. So if, you, if somebody from uh, Iran, if he wants to run uh, software, if he wants to download software, uh, free software, he's very much uh, allowed to do that. And we shouldn't discriminate. Uh, it's like a, a basic human uh, freedom, right? Uh, the sixth one is no discrimination against fields of endeavor. And this has become very popular now that the cloud has come up because uh, some software, some companies are trying to restrict where that software will run. So there has come some, there has came up some lessons that say you can't run a service in the clouds using the software. And one example of this uh, is MongoDB, for example. Uh, they, so they have restricted this, and, and this is just not free and open source software. And it's not just about the cloud. Th this has always happened. So Linux, uh, when, when it was created, many uh, providers, uh, it wasn't called the clouds, but ma many companies provided Linux uh, as, 
an infrastructure, and many people could use that, and and many people, many companies and individuals did use that, and they weren't paying royalty to to Linux or to the Linux community. They could use that freely. So just because it's called the cloud now, it doesn't make a difference. You you can still run a service and you can still charge for that uh, for that service. The distribution of the lessons is very important as well. Uh, so the rights attached to that program, they must apply to all to whom the program is redistributed without the need for execution on additional lessons by those parties. And this is important. You, you can't just take a, a software and just change the lessons uh, and, and not allow it to be free and, and open. You can't just close the, the, the software. Uh, you must allow people to download the same program and use it uh, normally. And this is important to respect, respect the offers wish to, to keep that as a free and open source software. Um, so there, there has been some changes to licenses uh, some companies, they used to have some program in their uh, particular lessons, and then they changed. But people can still use that older software version using their lessons. You can't prohibit per, uh, people using, from using their old software using their las lessons. So that's perpetual. Um, so that's the case, for example, for MongoDB which was using AGPL, and people can still use that older version uh, without any problems. Uh, the lessons must not be specific to a project. So the rights attached to the program must not depend on the programs being part of a particular software distribution. If the program is extracted from that distribution and used or distributed within the terms of the program's lessons, all parties to whom the program is redistributed should have the same rights as those that are granted in conjunction with the original software distribution. So this applies very well to the Debian uh, project because you guys use a lot of uh, projects. It's, it's not just uh, the Linux kernel. Uh, there are many other software that are part of this. And so each one of these have they might have a different lessons. And, and this goes in line as well with the, with the second, the ninth principle, which is the lessons must not restrict other software. So you can't make it viral. I mean, it, sometimes people are worried that you're going to install a free software and that the whole stack has to be open, has to be free. And that's not the case. So the lessons must not place restrictions on other software that is distributed along with the lessons software. For example, the lessons must not insist that all other programs distributed on the same medium must be open source software. Um, and finally, the tenth one. So what's interesting is that the, the Debian, um, the free, free software Debian guidelines had those nine principles since the very beginning. And the tenth one was added later, uh, which is the lessons must not be technology neutral. And this one is mostly to help people who are installing the, the software uh, via command line or via any other means. And it must be easy for them as well. You can't uh, have people force them to click to accept uh, a term or whatever. Um, it must be very easy to, to compile and to install. So that's why this was added. To free and open source software should be, should be easily available. If you want to automate the installation, you should allow this. So uh, that's uh, another interesting principle that was added. Uh, so that was that, that's basically the open source definition. Uh, this has been for over 20 years valid, and it has worked well. 
we have recently uh, had some ch uh, challenges. Some companies are trying to redefine what's open source, but the community has been very much uh, supportive of the open source definition, and they have, uh, and the open source initiative has worked together with the communities to protect uh, the open source definition. So, yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. So, I want to talk about the most popular OSI approved lessons. So, these are the most popular ones. So, we have the very, we starting from the very basic one, which is the most, uh, I would say, uh, permissive, which is the MIT. It's very short. It basically says, don't sue us. You can use the software, uh, but, but don't sue us. Uh, and it's very basic. It's like uh, a few paragraphs. And then we have the BSD. We have two versions of BSD, uh, the two clauses and the three clauses. And it's very ba basic as well. Uh, they have, uh, uh, it's similar to the, M the MIT and BSD. They're quite similar. And the more we go uh, to the bottom, the more reciprocal it becomes. And uh, let me explain what's reciprocal. So the MIT is very easy going. You can use for whatever purpose that you want, uh, as, long as, uh, as long as it respects the freedoms. But you can use that in a commercial product. You can make changes to that uh, software and if you don't want to release those, change, those changes, you don't have to. And you can, you can create a new license if you want um, and create a, a, a different program. Uh, the, and if you go down towards that and you reach the GPL or AGPL, those are very much, uh, they require you to, if you want to use this software um, and if you make changes, you have to make those changes available as free and open as well. So that's what what's about what that's the main difference about being reciprocal or not reciprocal. So if you if you want to make your software uh, very much available to anyone, and if you don't mind if they use that code for whatever, you probably should use like an MIT or BSD license. But if you really care about free software and open software, and you really want to, if people make changes, you really want to have them publish those changes, then probably you want to use it or a GPL, or if you are more strict, you can use the AGPL as well. Uh, if you guys want, I can go in more detail around this uh, later on. I can discuss with you guys. And also at opensource.org, we have a, a summary of this as well. And uh, since last year, especially, uh, while we were celebrating 20 years of the open source initiative, many companies have challenged, uh, I wouldn't say many companies, I would say some companies have challenged the open source definition. So we have uh, one famous one is Redis. They, ch they changed their, their lessons uh, for the commons class. Not the core products, but the software around that. So, and the Apache community was not very happy because they were using the Apache plus commons class. And the uh, Apache software uh, foundation, they had to protect their trademark. You can't just use the name and attach something to that that makes it non-free non and non-open. So the Apache was, they, their response was really strong in terms of having the commons clause, which makes it uh, non-open. We also have the server-side public lessons, which was uh, launched by the MongoDB. And one interest, and basically this lessons uh, was a way for MongoDB to have Amazon or other cloud providers to pay them a fee if they wanted to use MongoDB. Um, and I don't think that's actually working uh, as they intended. Um, and it's not, that's not free and open source software. 
uh, according to the definition, because you're restricting how you want the software to, to work uh, as a service. So, and this actually is quite interesting for the Debian project, because when MongoDB changed their lessons, the Debian project said, hey, this is not free software, we're, uh, we're not shipping we're not shipping uh, MongoDB uh, in the distribution. It's uh, non-free. And Red Hat and also Fedora, they dropped MongoDB. So if you wanted to install MongoDB on, on those uh, distributions, you would have to do it another way. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be normally available uh, on the Debian uh, projects. We also have uh, some other licenses, like the Confluence. Uh, what's interesting about the Confluence, they, they never said that this was open source, while the other two, Redis and MongoDB, they wanted to, to have their licenses um, acknowledged as open source, but they didn't succeed. But the Confluence lessons, uh, they were very f uh, straightforward, and they said, hey, this is not free and open source software, and, and that's OK. Um, I, I think that's important. If you want to use a license which is proprietary, you should be very clear about that. And not just mix open with uh, proprietary and try to squeeze like a, a bait and switch. So I, I think that's better. Uh, one interesting license as well is MariaDB, uh, which is like a fork of uh, MySQL. And what's interesting about that is that it's not open source uh, initially, but after a time, it becomes that software becomes an open source software. And so, um, you you made a uh, like a, uh, how how come is it open source or it's not? So uh, actually, uh, Bruce Perrins worked with uh, Maria DB, and that lessons he has a, a time expiration. Um, I, don't rem I don't remember how long that time, but it's like one year or whatever. So it's non-free, it's non-open for a period of time, for one year. And after that one year expires, then it becomes free and open source, free and open source software. So it's a, a quite interesting uh, change to the lessons, and that's the way that they they wanted to create a, a lesson so companies would pay for their advance, one year advance, to use their software. And after one year, everybody could use it. So that, that's uh, one of the ideas. And we have other ones. So for example, Facebook Reacts. This was a big, big news in like two years ago because they, they were using the BSD lessons but they added a patent clause saying that if you were to use React in one of your projects, wherever that is, you wouldn't be able to sue, fa sue Facebook for any patent uh, infringements. And it was like very viral. So if, if you were company X and you're doing, and you had a whole bunch of technology, and if one of the, the websites use React, this would, by using that, this would be, this lessons would be so viral that your whole company, as it is, you wouldn't be able to sue Facebook for whatever reason. So uh, clearly, that's not free and open source software. I think the intention was, I think it was fair, but. By making it so viral like that, I think it's, uh, it, it was not good. <laughs> and of course, open core is not open source. Perhaps the core is, but it's kind of a bait and switch. So we provide this software for you, and this open core is uh, open, it's free. But if you want something else, something more, you have to pay. And usually they have uh, some features that are essential, like security. You have to have a, a secure software for uh, to be available uh, over the over the web. 
so I'll give you an example. Elastic is one of those companies. So if you want security in Elastic, Elasticsearch, uh, you will have to pay an extra. That's, that wasn't part of Open Core. And this has caused a lot of problems because people were having some, some Elastic uh, software uh, that were open to everyone and people could steal information, very private information. So that, that's a challenge. If you're going to use Open Core as a, uh, as a strategy, at least have security as a, as a default, I would say, because otherwise it would be unethical, I believe. And so I, I want you, I'm not sure how many minutes we have here, I wanted to briefly talk about our anniversary. So last year we celebrated our 20th anniversary. And so Chris is here. <laughs> he was part of the celebration of the, the 20 years. And um, we participated in several events, over, four, uh, over 100 activities across 40 events worldwide. Uh, so we were part of FOSDEN uh, with a keynotes in Australia, California, Campus Party here in Brazil, Foz Asia. Um, so uh, we have France, we have uh, several places. Uh, if you go to the, to the next slide, please. Uh, we were also part of the, Oscar was celebrating their 20 years there. And we were celebrating, we, we decided to celebrate not just our anniversary, but other projects anniversary. So we participated with the, the, the GNU project, was 35 years. Um, let me see if I remember. The Mozilla was 20 years as well, celebrating. The Debian project, as, as I mentioned to you, was celebrating their 25th anniversary. The FreeBSD was celebrating uh, their 25th anniversary. So we work together with all those projects to celebrate their anniversaries as well. And um, so this is uh, my boss, Patrick. He was at campus party. I invited him to, to participate there to talk about the, the next 20 years of open source. So that's our mission at the OSI, to protect the open source definition that has served the whole community really well the Debian community is key to this because you, you guys were part of this since the very beginning. And so we really appreciate your help uh, on this regard. And with that, I open to questions if you guys have. <laughs> Does anybody have a, a question? Or if, if anybody wants to share a bit of history if you guys were part of the Debian community and you guys discussed about uh, fr the importance of free software and open source, uh, please go ahead. Hi. Okay. Um, so my question is about the occasional appearance of a, of a license that claims to be mm -hmm. open source definition compatible and yeah. isn't. Um, when this happens and you, you hear about this, what uh, what exactly is the OSI's response to the mm -hmm. company and to the public if that's different? Yeah. Is there a game plan every time? Yeah. What? So, Chris, do you want to take that? <laughs> um, do you have any... There's no specific... Do you, do you have an example in mind? Like, a concrete example, I mean... When You can pick any of the recent ones if there's a, a story to tell, I, I guess, but I'm sort of just wondering, does does nothing happen? Do people just talk about it on Twitter? Or does does OSI have some sort of, uh, do you see that there's an active role to play when this sort of thing occurs and steps of some kind are taken? Talking to people? Yeah, we, we, we certainly take an active role. Um, hopefully we do more than just post on Twitter. Um, the I guess we don't have a, a concrete game plan because I th that a one-size-fits-all just wouldn't work um, and it wouldn't be effective. 
Uh, there's often different motivations and different um, issues that need to be foregrounded in each case. Like, what if you know if one license is is particularly pushing this angle and one ang license particularly pushing that angle? Having a generic approach wouldn't really work. So we don't have a playbook for pushing back against this new style of license, if I can put it very flatteringly towards them. Um, so yeah, yeah. Oh. But I mean, we hopefully should be fairly active and noisy about these new licenses and things like that. And if I'm getting from your question that you aren't necessarily seeing that, that's not coming up on your radars in your particular Filter bubbles, let's put it that way. I, I guess I was just wanting to mm -hmm. know if there's a, we always talk to the company and ask them to change it. If there's always a, we make it very clear that you're not open source. And um, when people ask, I, I do know Patrick from events and, and things. So I've heard some, a story every, every now and then from him on this subject. I guess maybe it doesn't seem like uh, it doesn't seem like I frequently hear about OSI taking action or something, so I guess that was the question. It might help to make a distinction between um, cases where people are sort of accidentally using open source because they sort of think it sounds good and they attach it to their product names. And we do have a game plan for perhaps those more routine, um, be like, oh yeah, by the way, this is a this is a thing, by the way, you probably don't want to yeah, um, those ones. But your question was more about the, uh, the the bigger licensing changes and things like that. So yeah, um, as I say that, just to repeat myself, they don't necessarily have a, a concrete game plan for um, addressing those. Um, luckily, there haven't been too many. They've been big and they're problematic. Um, but but yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, perhaps expanding on that. Uh, there's a lot of discussion. We have a, a mailing list which, which discuss this, and everyone, every company or individual that proposes a license, um, we we try to discuss this and to see if th if that license or if that those changes if they are compatible with the, with the free software definition and with the open source definition. Of course, we're open to to look at if we want to change the open source definition, if there's a community consensus around, around changing some things, um, that could work. But uh, it, that's very difficult because the open source definition has been working for so long and it's, uh, not just 20 years. This is a, um, and not just the 35 years from the free software as well. This has been going on for, for a very long time. So that uh, discussion on the mailing list. We try to analyze this, and if it's indeed, if it fits and it's compatible with the free software definition and the open source definition, then their lessons they they can be approved by the OSI. Uh, but of course, the OS OSI doesn't want a proliferation of a lot of lessons, so we try to restrict that as well. <laughs> um. So, Nick, you talked a lot about the history of OSI, um, mm -hmm. and then we kind of touched on how, like, some of these uh, license ideas are coming up and that there isn't necessarily something in place right now. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us, like, what OSI is looking at doing in the next year or so? Um, like, as far as future activities, since we covered a lot of the historical activities. Yeah, so, um, Chris, would you, would you like to take that, and then I, I respond later? Since, uh, uh, first of all, I'm not part of the the board, the boards. Perhaps, uh, yeah, the <laughs> perhaps Chris can have a, a, a better insight on that, and I can talk about it as well. Um, in terms of plan for the upcoming year, are you referring to only to the um, new breed of licenses? Um, Certainly, we want to do a, little, a lot more outreach and sort of a lot more publicity. I mean, people, um, if people aren't seeing, there is, of course, the license um, discuss and the license review mailing lists, but they're pretty closed and they're pretty active, and so you can't really follow along. So um, perhaps a bit more media, what would you call it? Blanking on the word. Just a lot more publicity like longer blog posts position pieces things like that that's certainly on our radar for next year i think that will help 
um, not get ahead of the conversation, but that kind of thing. Um, in terms of, I mean, we can't stop people writing a license and then relicensing, right? Uh, but um, yeah, I'd be curious if you had any thing in mind. I mean, always willing to listen. Um, I do think that there is like a place for um, a more uh, proactive take on that. Um, we, uh, full disclosure, I'm at the Conservancy, and we often do opinion pieces, not only on licenses, but sometimes on business models and other trends in the um, free software community slash open source business sector. Um, and so, yeah, I, I mean, and it. It seems a natural thing for OSI to focus on the license things as they come up um, because uh, sort of tagging you know, what Nathan was noticing, I think, is that for many people that are maybe don't follow a handful of board members from OSI, it does seem like the large portion of the conversation is sort of the peanut gallery on Twitter. And so there's a, it just seems like there's a big opportunity there. Yeah, and uh, we'd be lying if we didn't uh, look at, say, the proactive stuff that the Conservancy does in sort of ethical areas, um, all, all manner of them, not just the business model and stuff, um, you know, privacy and et cetera, et cetera, all, all things user freedom. Um, it, we look at that and be like, yeah, we should certainly, if we move more towards a proactive angle in that, at least in terms of messaging, um, that would be certainly good instead of, perhaps coming across as being fairly reactive. It's a little bit misleading because the list is, um, the license discuss and license review lists are quite up there, but there's, I can't expect you to read those. I can't expect uh, the random peanut gallery on Twitter to read them. Um, they're, they're quite high volume, so, and fairly, often the conversation is quite niche and nuanced, <laughs> bunch of lawyers. Um, so, um, yeah being a bit more proactive um, and a bit more, mm -hmm. oh, I can't find the words today, uh, mainstream, that's wrong, that's awful words. You know, perhaps get what I mean there. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, this year, starting this year, especially going forward, we're investing a lot in education. So uh, recently we announced uh, a partnership with uh, Brandy's and soon with the Cornell University and also Berkeley, I believe, uh, about work, uh, working together to promote courses for open source programs. A lot of companies, uh, they have their own open source programs. And so we want to ad help educate those people. And we're working together with the To Do Group, the, the Linux Foundation, uh, and other companies and also affiliates to promote that and uh, to promote those courses and so to go uh, about the history about the lessons go into the detail why it's important to respect respect freedom and open open source uh, why it's important to uh, focus on a few lessons and not let proliferate a lot of lessons uh, one of the key takeaways uh, is that if you're a company and every, every time there's a new lessons, you're just going to spend more on lawyers to try to analyze those lessons to see if, if it's compatible and if you're, uh, you're, for, if you're complying with that. So companies are realizing that it's important to, to keep the, the number of lessons uh, restricted so that it doesn't cause confusion. Yeah, so I guess that's the time that we have. I really appreciate uh, um, you guys coming here and thank you the Debian community as well for working with the OSI and with all the open source communities and protecting free software and open source. So thank you guys. Thank you.